Good evening, everybody. Well, it's not that long ago, really, does of the economy in Western countries were actually run by the state. Airlines, for instance, a lot of them were nationalized and it was very expensive to travel. Yet now you can get a Ryanair to Milan for 20 quid. In Britain, there were some fairly obscure and even bizarre sectors of the economy that were run by the government, including even removals companies. Now, very few people today would suggest that type of economic policy. And I suspect in another generation, people will feel the same about money. Uh, now, Friedrich von Hayek was one of the great Austrian school economists. And he wrote several papers about uh, private sources of money. But actually, he won his Nobel Prize in 1974 for his work in how central banks setting interest rates distorts the economy. So that's going to tie into some of the things that we're going to speak about today. Uh, but essentially, just as prices in other sectors of the economy should be set by the market rather than by committees of economists, uh, Hayek would say the same thing is the case with interest rates. And then the final thing we're going to talk about today, which you've heard a, a bit about already, is some of the ideas surrounding central banks uh, absorbing these technologies and how they might be used uh, and what this means really from an Austrian school perspective. And the think tank that I run, the Cobden Center, uh, in 2016, uh, we ran the European Parliament Blockchain Summit. And so we had the IMF, the OECD, uh, the World Bank, the UN, the Bank for International Settlements, Europol and so on, all attending. It was the first time all of these institutions had ever attended a blockchain event. And we also had the NASDAQ stock exchange, a lot of companies like Microsoft and so on. And essentially, we, we discussed many of these issues and how it might develop. Now, a couple of people today have, have asked me really whether this blockchain stuff is just a lot of hot air, just a fad. Now, at the, at the European Parliament summit, every single one of the global institutions understood that this is going to bring about profound changes in the economy. Uh, it's, it's extremely innovative. Now, it's difficult to predict at this stage how that's going to develop, but we know that it will bring about major changes to our economy. And yes, yeah, so following that event, actually, um, Europol and the OECD uh, kindly wrote papers for the Cobden Center uh, going through some of these issues, which you can find at our website. But one of the most interesting points that kept coming up was this idea that when money can be created privately, essentially control over monetary policy instruments is then ceded to the private sector. In other words, central banks will no longer have the power to pursue the kind of monetary policy that they would want to and which a lot of modern mainstream economics would recommend, including some of the more radical forms of monetary policy that we've seen over recent years. Now, what we're entering now really is the first true free market in money of the modern age, that is the information age. So I'm sure everyone here has heard of Bitcoin, but you should understand there's a lot of different alternatives now. Digital gold is just uh, emerging, uh, but also, for instance, Gridcoin was set up by the University of California at Berkeley. And with Gridcoin, when you offer, the, uh, offer up your computational power from your home computer to be used for scientific research in medicine, mathematics, and physics, you are rewarded in newly created grid coins. Then following this, Stanford University set up CureCoin along a similar principle. Um, so if you donate the computing power of your home computer, uh, you are rewarded in CureCoin. And that computing power is then used for research in protein folding which requires huge computational resources. So essentially, you're leading to the discovery of these important new medicines, but being paid in these new forms of coins. So really, this is very innovative. Uh, it's a complete shift from what we've seen before in terms of traditional central bank money. And actually, this brings forth a concept uh, from one of the great Austrian school economists called Fritz Machlup, uh, and that's the concept of moneyness, the idea that in different scenarios, 
different things have different levels of moneyness. Uh, he was actually talking about, for instance, certain forms of debt instruments. But in, in one of the Bank of England's papers on, on digital currencies, they also talked about cigarettes being used as money in, in prisons and concentration camps and so on. So that's important to bear in mind here when we're talking about these different forms of money. Sometimes people say which one is going to replace central bank money. Was actually, it's, it's more useful if you think about it, this, term, this, kind of, this idea of moneyness. That diff some, different forms of money will be more useful in different scenarios, in different areas of the economy. Now, in terms of some of the technological developments, we've heard about some of them today. Uh, Veronica talked about them. One of the most interesting aspects, uh, you can see this quote here from Charles Hoskinson, is this idea that the money itself becomes programmable. So you can program terms and conditions into the money. So let's say for sake of example, you send some money to one of your children. You can program into that money what it can and can't be used for. So that's, that's a major uh, development for the economy and really for society as well. But in a moment, we'll also be talking about what's likely to happen if the state starts issuing uh, blockchain-based money. I mentioned Friedrich von Hayek earlier. So again, he'd written several papers about competing forms of money, but he won his Nobel Prize for his work in essentially how central bank setting interest rates distorts the economy. Now again, having committees of, of economists and bureaucrats setting prices has failed essentially in every other sector. It's been attempted in many economies the government setting the price of food, of fuel, of consumer goods. We see it at the moment in Venezuela, uh, where the government sets the price of food and the shelves are empty. Now, in essence, the Austrian school applies this to interest rates. It treats interest rates as a form of prices. So, for instance, in a free market, if more people are saving, that means there's a greater pool of savings, so interest rates come down. Uh, if more people wanted to borrow, then that will push up interest rates. So again, just like other prices in the economy, it's constantly equilibrating. Uh, when a central bank sets interest rates too low, essentially more credit is created than is justified by the amount of savings in the economy. Um, so this results in a distortion in the time preferences of the economy. But also importantly, uh, the, the actual capital structure of the economy will start to mold itself around these new lower interest rates. So this has been talked about a fair amount by the BIS, for instance. I actually gave a seminar at the OECD last year on the Austrian school, uh, and they said it tallies with some of their work in terms of zombie companies and so on. Uh, Bill talked about uh, falling productivity. So again, the capital structure of the economy is molding itself around these artificially low interest rates. Now, private money creation in whatever form that comes, is going to allow a move away from this type of economy where, where uh, interest rates are set artificially low by central bank. So if interest rates are allowed to be set by the, essentially the free market, again, the demand and supply of credit, then time preferences can become re-coordinated and the economy can begin to function as normal again. So we'll move away from this system uh, of the economy molding itself around 0% interest rates. Now, with the development of blockchain, we've already seen hundreds or maybe even a thousand plus different types of money that appeared so far. But surely what you'll also see over the coming years is credit markets as well. And so blockchain is very nicely set up, really, so that in principle, you could have both peer-to-peer -peer lending, but also you could have intermediaries on a blockchain as well. So again, this, this reinforces, coming back to that idea that I mentioned at the European Parliament Blockchain Summit, that there's going to be a move away from central bank power. Once money can be created privately, but also importantly, once credit markets can take place away from central banks set by interest rates, then, then it's a move away from that system. So from the perspective of, of Friedrich von Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, again, it's allowing interest rates to be set by the free market which will allow economic recovery. The IMF have done a fair amount of work on this. Their blockchain team attended the European Parliament Summit 
And actually, this quote nicely sums up a position. So again, if, if more people are using private forms of money, then in the case of uh, by negative demand shock, essentially for non-economists, a recession. In traditional economics, the central bank lowers interest rates, expands the quantity of money, and stimulates the economy out of recession. Now, if they can't do that, that can lead to a deflationary spiral, as it's shown here. But from the perspective of, of Friedrich von Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, again, when a central bank lowers interest rates, they're not stimulating the economy. Um, all they're doing is sending false price signals to the economy. They're distorting the economy. Just like when governments in Venezuela set the price of food or anything like that, what we need really is interest rates set by the market rather than by government bureaucrats. So in that sense, the IMF have got it, have got it back to front here. And we see, again, this general idea more and more. So the National Bureau for Economic Research talked about how as private forms of money become more competitive, it will force central banks to pursue a tighter monetary policy. Now again, relating to the, this to the, the brilliant talk that Bill gave earlier, essentially it, it, it makes it very, very difficult to have these years and years of 0% interest rates if people can quickly move out of that into another form of money. An example I came across recently, there's a guy I know in America who set up a company where essentially you can deposit your money with them and it will be, they will buy gold. So essentially it's converted into gold. But what they will do then is lend out the gold to hedge funds and so on. There are various financial institutions that borrow gold on a short term basis and they will then insure that with several insurance companies. So again, your money uh, is then essentially gold. You're receiving interest on that gold uh, and obviously it's, it's insured, so it's very safe. So, so compared to, to the current financial system, it's really a win-win. Uh, you know, you're benefiting at every level. But of course, if people are moving over to that type of system, it takes power away from central banks to pursue quantitative easing and other forms of radical monetary policy. So they're forced to pursue a tighter monetary policy. Again, in, in the ECB paper, it's interesting here, they suggest perhaps trying to impose minimum reserve requirements on virtual currency schemes. Now, if we think back to a couple of the examples I gave, like Berkeley and, and Stanford, essentially having money that in essence is backed by, uh, you know, by medical research, for instance, really some of these ideas just don't make much sense. They're thinking in terms of 20th century or even 19th century central banking models. Um, you know, it sounds like something out of budget here, whereas the world we're moving into is gonna be radically different so, so a money based on, backed by medical research is just something materially different to, to, their, to the paradigm that they're operating from within. Now, th this has been touched on today in several of the talks. The ideas of, of central banks creating their own digital currencies. Now, I, I'm talking about blockchain here, but in essence, that's not the important bit. It, it could be any of the, the emerging technologies used for money. But for sake of simplicity, we'll talk about blockchain. Um, so Andrew Haldane is the chief economist at the Bank of England. He gave one of the, the first speeches on this. Again, it was actually a speech on, on negative interest rates. So negative interest rates create a lot of problems for central banks. Uh, in essence, we're at zero now. If they go negative, then it's simply people are incentivized to just pull their money out of banks and store it in cash. Yet if if, a, uh, if the state or a central bank could issue a blockchain-based money. I talked earlier about how the money is essentially programmable. Uh, we saw that quote from Hoskinson, how you can program terms and conditions into the money. So negative interest rates could be programmed into the money itself. So essentially there's nowhere to run and nowhere to hide for savers. So it really allows central banks to pursue this kind of radical monetary policy. Now again, from their perspective, they're just doing the logical next step. So for the last generation, we've had steadily lower and lower interest rates. Um, so with every recession, they've cut interest rates. Then after the recession, they raise them, but not back to where they were before. So it's like a ratchet effect, pushing down and down interest rates. So essentially with every recession, they've created an even larger debt bubble. It gets larger and larger. So after the crash, after the dot-com bubble crash, um, it was 1% interest rates in 2003 and 4 by the Fed. 
that created a massive housing bubble that crashed in 2008. In, in 2000, in, around 2007, 8, there was about $150 trillion of global aggregate debt. Since then, so in only a decade of 0% interest rates, that's now gone up to $250 trillion. But again, from that perspective, from, you know, that we've, we've heard a lot about it today, the, the, really the logical next step when the re next recession hits is to go negative, is to go to negative interest rates. That's the only way to, keep, to, to create an even larger debt bubble. But again, it makes it very difficult to have negative interest rates if actually people can substitute out of that money and into some other form of money. Like for instance, the gold money I was talking about where you actually receive interest and it's very safe, as good as gold, literally. Again, there's a, there's a quote from Payak here where he actually sounds perhaps melodramatic saying that depriving money, just depriving governments of their power over the supply of money is necessary to save civilization. But yeah, the, the quote from Bill earlier really laid out very well what we're facing here in, in terms of just larger and larger debt bubbles. Every recession really for an entire generation has just been treated by creating an even larger debt bubble. And this is gonna come to an end whether it's in five years or 10 years or whenever. So these ideas will be crucial that people can substitute out of, of central bank money and into alternatives, especially if they pursue negative interest rates. So again, really negative interest rates from an Austrian school perspective, it's, it's, it's really an absolute aberration in terms of the principles of economics. It would of negative real interest rates, that is, it would really never occur in a free market. So if you look at something like peer-to-peer -peer lending, which alerts it's a fringe area of the economy, it is in essence a kind of free market in lending. You know, if you were to go on a peer-to-peer -peer lending website and say you want to borrow 30,000 pounds to set up a business, and they, you know, people say, well, what interest rate are you going to offer? And if you were to say, I want minus 5%, I want you to pay me for borrowing the money. Of course, you're not going to get that loan. The question is at the end is easier. But so the only way this really can be implemented is through, is through a central bank uh, blockchain type of money. And again, that's a complete suppression of market pricing mechanisms. Interest rates are a crucial form of prices for the economy in terms of pricing risk, in terms of time preferences, and many other sectors of the economy are important in terms of how, how interest rates coordinate resources in those sectors of the economy. So the more central banks uh, implement these types of radical monetary policies, the more distorted the economy is going to, going to become. And so to conclude, I mean, we've had some great talks today as well about Volgeld. And actually, I think some of these ideas are quite complementary. So for instance, in some ways, an ideal monetary system might have something along the lines of sovereign money, uh, Volgeld, but also with competing currencies. And again, there's a few benefits. So first of all, there's going to be benefits in terms of the innovations that happen with private forms of money, in terms of how the payment systems, again, things like the money becoming programmable that we've seen, these types of things. So I think this idea of, of uh, private money is, is complementary with Volgeld. And really, I think one of the issues with monetary reform is we have the, these kind of fractured little groups all over the place, each advocating for their own system. And I think that the current system is so bad that we really, we just need to come together, push forward you know, these ideas together. So, and really the answer to that is gonna be something along the lines of you know, Chicago style plan, Volgeld, with competing currencies. And yes, so I'd just like to finish saying Competition has, has really achieved a lot in many different sectors of the economy. You know, smartphones, um, so many things are, are just improving year by year. And I think this will also apply to money. So, so I think we're entering a brave new world for money, but we've really seen some of the dangers as well today and what will happen if the state and central banks starts using this technology. Thank you.